morning. I suggest we now start our debate. Is sustainable exploitation of strategic metals possible? The main characteristic of uh, strategic metals is to be strategic. If uh, the any transition is full of uh, good intentions, there are many dangers as well. It could be transformed into a uh, open in the commercial war. A few days ago, China made a tough decision. It decided to make the conditions for exporting as, um, uh, essential metals more difficult. So our debate is also a strategic debate. It will be coordinated by Valérie Mignon, member of the Secular Economist, Professor at Nanterre, and a specialist in international economics. We have uh, the following participants who have agreed to participate, and I'd like to thank them very much, very, very much. Thank them very, very warmly. We have Christelle Boris, uh, who is the chair and CEO of Remet. He worked with Pechini and Daphne, and she worked with Rio Tinto as well. She's very familiar with the world of mines. She will be able to tell us how this sector is absolutely vital now, and Remet plays a vital role within it. André Los Grug Petri is the chairman of the Joint European Disruptive Initiative, the JEDI for Europe to take the initiative again in disruptive innovation. He has worked with the Ministry of Armies, has managed several investment funds, where he spent 10 years in working in China. China is the elephant in the room, I think. I'm probably going to talk a lot about China. Maya Sherbo has spent 20 years working for SAP. She's the managing director of Europe Envision Digital. He is in charge of developing decarbonization missions using the digital technology and uh, digital technology is obviously a very important part of the climate transition. Then finally we are Slam Chikawi, chairman of the NSV Studies Center but set up in 1993 in Algeria. He's worked a great deal on uh, rare earths. He's also an excellent observer of uh, the challenges and influences that uh, take place in North Africa and the Middle East. Valerie, over to you to lead the debate. Thank you, Sabine. Hello, everybody. So minerals and strategic metals are at the heart of uh, considerable geopolitical and geographical uh, challenges. You know that we hear a lot about these elements today. The reason for that, reason for that they play an absolutely crucial role in the uh, energy and environmental transition because they are absolutely vital for low carbon technologies. One of the major problems is that the geographical distribution of world production of these metals is very unequally distributed. You have cell countries that play, uh, play a naturally central role in the extraction of minerals and on the metals market, and this is particularly the case of China because of the resources in, uh, that it contains. Uh, despite this wealth of uh, minerals and metals, like other countries, it's not in a dominant position for the production of all of the minerals and of the ores, and uh, mining production does not enable it to satisfy all of its own needs. And so, therefore, it has de developed an ambitious strategy to strengthen its dominant position and put the other countries in uh, a position of dependency upon it. And to do that, it has put in place a vast uh, policy for international development of its companies with a diversity of means used, in particular direct uh, foreign direct investment, the acquisition and uh, buying up of shares in the local and the international companies, the development of new uh, mining projects, etc., etc. In parallel to that, Uh, China is playing a greater role in refining, so it's now the leading actor in the world in the refining of these uh, metals. And due to uh, environmental standards which are not very demanding, concretely, China has agreed to uh, take the environmental cost of uh, refining of the minerals which are extremely uh, polluting. At the same time, as it has very rich minerals in its soil, this uh, refining activity enables it to produce all of the strategic metals and to now dominate all of the markets. So faced with this uh, situation, 
and with the demand for metals which will increase considerably, what should be our strategy for the uh, Western countries? I have identified five possibilities, and we'll talk about these later. The first uh, possibility consists in exploiting the resources in our national uh, soils. That consists in opening up mines and or, or finding new extraction uh, techniques. Recently, we've heard about the Emily project of opening up a lithium mine in the Allier region of France. There are others also. The central point here is the question of the responsible nature of mining to prevent or to reduce the environmental externalities. The second possibility consists in strengthening and developing recycling uh, methods. This makes it possible to reduce imports of metals and to reduce environmental externalities. You know that uh, recycling pre produces less external pollution than the mining of uh, metals from a mine and makes it possible to have more sustainable operation of existing mines. In addition, recycling usually re requires less energy than primary production, and therefore makes it possible to be freed at least partly from any uh, increase in energy prices. This third possibility consists in building up stocks of strategic metals in order to deal with possible disruptions in the production process and to avoid uh, stock uh, shortages and supply shortages and uh, the impact on prices. The fourth possibility is to diversify the sources of supply either by implementing an investment uh, strategy as China has done or by developing new partnerships. Finally, the, f the last possibility that we've been talking about more and more is what we call metal sobriety. As you know, metals consume a lot of water and generate strong pressure on water resources. So in addition, some materials such as copper or cobalt could become extremely critical by 2050, depending on the uh, climate scenarios we adapt. So this means that uh, particular attention is being, being paid to metal sobriety and in the support of citizens to a low carbon transition. The work that needs to be carried out today is important because in general, we don't uh, associate the uh, low carbon concept to the minimalization of metal consumption, whether for the decision makers and policy makers or for us as citizens. So. Several possibilities could be envisaged. We've talked about uh, considerably reducing disposables and uh, reducing legislation to prevent uh, programmed obsolescence to uh, show the uh, metal content of products that we buy. We're going to talk about all of this today with our four participants, our panel members, who uh, we're very honored and pleased to welcome here today. Thank you, Valerie. So at first sight, what could be more incompatible than a mining and mine and the environment? This is the theme of the Crystal Boris. You want us to be tolerated, you want to be loved when you open up a mine. Yes, this is one of our CSR commitments. And I can tell you that this drives our commitment and motivation of all our employees to be liked or loved in our jobs. I'd like to come back just to be central to the theme is sustainable exploitation of strategic metals possible. I'd just like to come back to two points which were mentioned just earlier. I don't agree. China doesn't have very many critical metals on its territory. It has very little lithium, only 10% of world reserves. It has very little nickel, hardly any nickel. And there's a little bit of manganese, only a very poor quality, and it doesn't have any, have any cobalt at all. So, objectively, apart from coal, it doesn't have a lot of uh, ore. And that's why, very quickly, it decided to find the mines where they were, where the geology puts them, because that's something we have to bear in mind. Geology is what it is, and so the deposits are where they are, and uh, 
whereas we can reindustrialize uh, the transformation and processing phases, we can't transfer the locations of the mines themselves. We have to get the metals where they are. I'd just like to answer the question about whether sustainable uh, exploitation of metals is possible. My answer is yes, of course. It is possible, and in fact, it's absolutely vital. I'd like to start from that point. It's absolutely vital because we're going to need a lot of metals for the energy transition. We do have to do recycling as well, and we work a lot on recycling. That's fundamental. But to recycle, you have to first extract the, the, the metal. That's a fairly basic idea. We extract, then we build, we process, we use for 15 or 20 years the battery. I'm talking about the battery for, uh, for possibly with the second life after that. And then you can recycle the battery. So recycling of all these materials for the energy transition will become uh, very important and uh, concerns the supply process in 20 or 30 years' time. We estimate that recycling will represent about 20% of the supply by 2030. No more than that. So 80% will still come from uh, primary extraction by mining. The secondly, it's absolutely vital because the expectations of all of the stakeholders, whether it's consumers in the value chain, the financial markets, the customers, these expectations are increasingly high in terms of the societal and environmental responsibility. And so what previously was nice to have a few years ago is now a must, absolutely must have now. So I would say we don't really have a choice. So now we have to see whether it's possible and how we approach this. I think essentially it's a question of uh, ambition and determination because the technologies and the methods exist. The only point is that they are often more expensive, so there is an impact on prices for the end user, but the methods and technologies exist. And uh, we have to have this ambition at Aramet. We have this ambition, as you've said. We have put uh, societal and environmental responsibility right at the heart of our business model ever since uh, 2018. The central pillar of the Aramet strategy is to be a uh, responsible and con company. We have uh, defined this in a mission statement for responsible processing and living together, which are the uh, the guideline for everything we do at Aramet. For Aramet to be, if we have high performance in uh, CSR for our managers, it's just as important for their careers as to have high performance in uh, production and uh, in terms of finance. It's just as important. So it's a question of ambition. So after that, do we then have the methods? And it's, the important thing is to have an overall global approach because sustainable mining is an ecosystemic approach. We are part of a geographical landscape, an economic landscape, and a cultural landscape. And so this means we have to pay attention to all of the steps of the process. We pay attention to biodiversity, carry out with the impact assessments, we identify the uh, animal uh, passageways, we look at all of the different aspects of animal presence and look at all, all the different species that are present, we put those in a nursery, we're capable of rehabilitating and renovating an area, and we, uh, we uh, the renovate the topsoil and we put back all of the biodiversity and we return the land to the local communities. We carry out uh, economic uh, deployment the development and uh, community development as well. It's very important to have all of this uh, uh, ensemble of points in the ecosystem. Then we have our value chain where we have to be careful about sobriety. We have lots of digital tools with drones and algorithms to get exactly what we need, not to put back more, take out more earth than we need to to extract the metals. We have uh, methods, for example, a technology for extraction of lithium, which saves a lot more water than the traditional uh, technologies. We are very careful with our water resources. So those technologies do exist. Then we have all of the decarbonization part in the processing stage with the uh, biocarbons and the capture of CO2 and the transition to hydrogen. All of these technologies and methods approaches exist. Then it really is a question of uh, uh, 
uh, ambition and determination, a question of uh, investment over a period of time. And I believe that by applying the best possible standards, and we make sure we are always aligned with the best practices, there is a standard that is being imposed in Europe, which is the IRMA standard, an international standard for responsible mining. All of the people in the battery industry are adopting this IRMA standard. It determines the best practice in social, societal and environmental spheres. And if all of the uh, players like us decide to certify all of their operations and uh, to satisfy EMA standards, uh, sustainable mining is possible. Then we can talk about how Europe makes sure that all of the mining uh, actors are aligned with these standards. We can talk about that uh, later on, if you like. Thank you very much. I think you've all persuaded us You've shown us that uh, technology plays a central role in uh, progress. Another question is whether China has already won the game. Of course, the game isn't won until the last possible moment. So, Mr. André Lozy Kruger Pietri, you would like to talk about the technological uh, aspects? Yes, I'm going to yes, talk about uh, industrial policy. Uh, as practiced by China and innovation. So three figures, 97%, 94% and uh, 93%, 97% is the proportion that China controls of refining, as uh, Crystal said, of what we call the permanent magnets. What are permanent magnets? For us, this is absolutely central in Europe. This is what makes it possible to have offshore wind turbines to provide, to, uh, to reduce maintenance costs and all electric motors to make them uh, give them better performance. Uh, instead of having a stator, uh, a conventional stator, retor, or a coil. So 97%. So we have to wake everybody up in this uh, summer warmth. We can say that the European Green Deal is becoming buy from China deal. If we're not careful, and I am very uh, attached to the uh, green transition, we are creating much more dependence uh, to China that we had with Russia, say 97, 94%. These are the two elements we've had a lot of great deal about over the last few days because China has just decided to issue export licenses. As usual in China, it doesn't necessarily implement it, it just threatens. You have all used gallium this morning because it's used in your chargers. It's used as power electronics, which is absolutely vital for electric motors. The germanium is a little bit different. It's strategic as well. It's used in semiconductors and especially and in nighttime vision goggles. China has been doing this for 15 years. So when I hear some public and private players saying we're discovering this subject, it's not true. In 1990, in the 1990s, two figures here. The U.S. controlled between 50 and 75 percent of production of what we call rare earths. The 17 elements, uh, which are partly magnetoreactive, with the various exotic names. And at La Rochelle, we refined 50 percent of rare earths in the world. That was it, Roger. Until we relocated to guess where? Yes. In the year 2000, the Chinese started to reduce exportations by 40%. This is 20 years ago. They reduced the uh, exports by 40%, so the prices went up. We had a shock in 2010 that our Chinese friends will remember. There was a, a Japanese prime minister. I prefer to make that clear because uh, the, the Japanese prime minister finished, finished to one of these sanctuaries where there were war criminals. and. Uh, the Chinese reacted, and what did they use as their weapon? They made a complete embargo on rare earths. Some of them uh, increased their prices by a thousand percent. We think a part of the development of hybrids is due to that, because there was this uh, desire to not be completely dependent on the Chinese rare earths. And now we can see we are um, taking a decision about the exports of machine tools for semiconductors on the 30th of June. On the 3rd of July, we had these export licenses for these two rails. Deng Xiaoping, who has been dead uh, for some years, had this uh, phrase that he said, Saudi Arabia has oil, China has rare earths. 
So we can't say that we hadn't been warned. So concerning innovation, there are solutions. Japan has, uh, in eight years, between 2010 and 2018, it reduced uh, 58 by 58 percent its imports of rare earths and critical metals, which is a wider uh, category than rare earths. It's critical metals. There are three possibilities that we don't think about today to have these uh, mixes in the batteries. I have a greater expert than myself next to me. Today we can imagine that as these are really cocktails of different metals, being the cathode and the anode and the analyte, also we have to maybe use artificial intelligence, which will enable us to test different combinations. So this interdisciplinarity of innovation is an important thing. The second thing is recycling, as Crystal has said. This is a key point today. We believe that between 4 and 5 percent of the batteries are recyclable only. And this is a very complicated subject because we're going to have to do what we, we call hydrometallurgy. We're going to have to use a lot of water, which causes pollution. And finally, the last thing we don't hear about in Europe, but when you look at the speeches by the internal uh, security advisor, Jake Sullivan, he talks about s synthetic biology. This is uh, the next uh, big development. We can imagine that some, a part of our economies, and this will reconcile today with tomorrow perhaps and give us hope, will be move on to a, an economy of generation. We will produce uh, leather and milk and meat and uh, replacements for critical metals that are being extracted using biologic processes based on nature. This isn't something that is impossible. This is something we have to think about much more in Europe. And finally, we have to remember this is a very political question. This subject of rare earths and critical metals raises the problem of industrial policy and anticipation. This was announced in advance. So how do we get back to having a long-term uh, approach in our economies? The phenomenal thing, we see that with COVID and is that the authoritarian countries have a long-term vision for very bad reasons. I think the real enemy for our humanist values is the communist, uh, the Chinese Communist Party, not the country, but the Chinese Communist Party within China. That's something we have to fight against. But we shouldn't allow this party to control long-term thinking and to be also have the monopoly on uh, short-term agility. In Europe also, we are, whenever there's a problem, we create a fund. We have to implement this money and use this money. I remember the fund of 750 million euros that we created just after the COVID crisis, May 2020. Only 20% of that was invested. That's a complete scandal. And now people want to get more money. So we have to be much more demanding on the execution of our investment. Although I respect the uh, decisions of certain French and German uh, and European policymakers, behind the great speeches, it gives the impression we make, we take action. It takes away the feeling of urgency. We have to be much more attentive to our execution. And the last thing is the cost of afterwards. We are trying to invest in subjects which are very risky or too risky for uh, and too long term for the private sector. And that's where the state has to play a role. First of all, we have to give a vision once more, a, a societal vision. I don't ever think anybody gets excited about creating rare earths or quantum computers. It has to be explained. It has to be a, a project for society. President Kennedy, when he was talking about the moon launch in '62, he said a very simple objective. He said, we're putting somebody on the moon before the end of the decade, and we're getting him back in good health. And there were 10,000 industrial projects were built around that project. That's what's missing from us for rare earths. What made it possible to synthesize them was the Manatal uh, project. And the last thing I wanted to say, we're all a bit schizophrenic. I love to listen to people who are very liberal, in their points of view, saying we have to do more, but that, that after that, they tend, they turn to the state. I would also like to talk to the entrepreneurs and the SMEs, and I say to them, of course, we can hope that we'll have a state and a European Commission that is more agile and looking further ahead, but it's also up to us, as in education and also in research, it's up to civil society to mobilize itself and to show the way as well. And we shouldn't all wait uh, for a solution to be provided by a centralized state or a uh, European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was impressive. 
this figure uh, uh, just 20 percent spent uh, i've heard it this was actually the most interesting thing that i've heard for some quite some time mr sugo would you rather talk about the raw material value chain is safety right yes i'm talking from the industrial point of view by 2035 there will be no combustion engine purchase so we need alternatives that will be e-cars, but we're also working on hydrogen cars, hydrogen-powered cars. So that means that we have to manufacture a large quantity of e-cars. There are 35 giga factories in the world, and there are uh, not a lot in, in Europe. 300 billion, that's the investments for e-cars. To manufacture e-cars, we start with the raw materials. So that's modules. We'll add all the workforce work, energy, because we want to produce batteries that are as decarbonated as possible, so no gas use. This is the ambition that we have in our group, and to have factories that are carbon-free, to have clean energy, to produce and manufacture batteries. And then for each uh, 10 giga gigawatt hour, we should have 500 uh, gigawatt hour uh, of clean energy. So a lot of clean energy in the end. The part that corresponds to the raw materials that is in the module represents 40 to 50% of the price of the battery. If the battery price is 100 euros per kilowatt hour, you have 40 to 50 hours energy, 2.2 to 7%. These batteries need to be sold to the um, car manufacturer, and they're not much more higher than the others. Otherwise, we'll have everyone in the street. So the issue for the industrialists is not easy. When you aggregate all the problems and you add this environmental considerations to political considerations, the standards as well, the standards that were made by the the AT, the RMA, the ISO 14001, uh, 4044. That means that you have a uh, wider array of components, and politicians do not, are not aware of it. And you have to implement this to make sure that you're competitive, that you have a cutting edge. So the value chain is very complex. These are contracts that are long term contracts. The energy contract to have clean energy to produce, to manufacture batteries, to have raw materials. These are 25 year old contracts. So, when you have a power purchase agreement, you need to have all the assumptions taken into consideration Infl inflation, the uh, energy price increase, so that you can remain profitable and, uh, in, over the long run. So, these are long term contracts, and the political decisions that are made are often political decisions about frequent, short term, that will disrupt this value chain and these long term service provision agreements. So what we should do is leave the industrialists work together on the value chain and as much as possible as it happened in some sectors like telecommunications, telecommunications started to innovate and imagine new things when politicians said, okay, we, we, we leave it up to you. The GSM, for instance, it was invented in 12 years where all the stakeholders of telecoms worked hand in hand and imagined a new standard on which all the market aligned. For energy, they would want to do the same, to have the same type of innovation with uh, smart cooperation. What we should do is to have the industrialists work together, have a financial business model and to, over the long term, to have to safeguard the value chain. What is important is digital. Digital. We cannot implement interesting decisions. In a, a plane, you have a cockpit. The pilot doesn't do everything. It's, you need a, a AI. It's with the raw materials, the production, the operation, the commissioning, may it be for stationary batteries or batteries and recycling, everything. We need cooperation. Alongside this, we need talents. And we need to converge four skills. We need 
environmental talents, economic talents, industrial and digital talents. And there's a fifth dimension, which is political. I think politicians could be involved in decisions provided that they were industrialists before and that they take that into granted when they make the decisions. Thank you. Alan Shikawi, it's up to you now. The floor is yours. You're going to talk about the North African and Middle Eastern uh, region, the challenges and opportunities. And how about uh, the situation with China? Is it a confrontation, cooperation? How is it going? Indeed, you have launched a debate. You have given the key terms straight away. Are we going towards cooperation or confrontation? That's a matter of perception. The perception from the industrialized societies is not the same as the one from the countries which have the natural resources, rare minerals. That's where the issue is. We should accept it. There's a reality. It's all about politics, geopolitics. They are the drivers of the economy and not the other way around. I understand the industrialist's point of view, but from a political point of view, there's another dimension, China. Indeed, you have talked about China, and Crystal has said it rightfully. China does not hold the majority of natural resources. However, it has a control on the natural resources that are elsewhere in Africa, in sub-Saharan uh, uh, Africa and in North Africa, in Algeria, for instance. So indeed, to ma make a transition with my own country, we have adopted a new policy, a development policy for these uh, for the extraction of this uh, mineral resources. And that hasn't been the case for 60 years. So there was a strong political will that was displayed to leave these natural resources for the future. That's a first element. Secondly, shared cooperation. Well, what is happening right now is to have a, general, a generational transition of governance, of, govern, of elite, those that hold mineral resources. So we have a new generation coming up. But this new generation is not listened to, is not heard, both at once. So there is a confrontation, even if it is not violent, if it's not military, but in it, it's the, the gist of it, because there's history. We've had history with China, for instance, and China has developed, we, we talk about soft power. I'm going to use the concept smart power, rather, China has used smart power rather than soft power. And that has been confirmed with the pandemic, with the health crisis, how China has reaffirmed its position, as, as we have mentioned earlier on off the record together, China has two, is, is, is twofold, threefold ahead of us because it has reinforced its positions with regards to these countries. How did it do that? Reinforcing scientific or sanitary diplomacy during the COVID era to reinforce its relationship with these countries and to consolidate and, and to uh, uh, um, remove and erase the past in terms of history. So it does not have the rare earths, but it has control, indirect control, over these minerals. And I will wrap up with this once again. It's up to the politicians 
and the governance elite to understand that we have to think out of the box and we need to reach shared cooperation rather than uh, confrontation. Otherwise, it's going to be a dead end. Thank you. If someone wants to react, I had planned a question about efficiency of the European machine on that subject, but I had my answer actually already. Christelle? Yeah. I would like to react as to the geopolitical side. Indeed, there's a lot of geopolitical diplomacy to develop. We have to develop mineral diplomacy, a raw material diplomacy. We were saying that China has rare earths, but uh, doesn't have strategic uh, critical m uh, metals. The Europeans neglected these countries. China started earlier than us. The Japanese do that quite well, Asians in general. The US as well, with ERA, they over multiplied everything and they're going at a very fast pace and they're um, catching up on their, um, on, on their delay. Europe is also trying to do its best, but we're still lagging behind in what we're trying to implement in terms of trade agreements in terms of financing tools for these projects because China is coming up with a lot of cash already when we talk about smart power to develop infrastructures, to develop projects in the countries at stake concerned. And we're coming with a lot of um, morality and, um, with not a, and not with a lot of cash. And the African countries, well, they say all is well, but you have to help us develop and you can't say, OK, we want to lend you money but and then you need to check that box and that box and that box, and they never managed to get it in the end. So I think that we are becoming aware of this slowly but surely. And to follow up on what was said by Christelle, you know, we shouldn't dream. We don't have uh, raw materials in Europe. We have a bit of lithium in Allier. We have geothermal lithium. If we put all that together, maybe we'll have 10 to 15 percent of our needs. We don't have any cobalt. We don't have any nickel. So we have to wake up. Natural resources are, wha are where they are. We have to fund projects in the countries which have these resources and enter into economic and political agreements with them because they need de to develop. They're ready to, de to cooperate with Europe because it's a huge market for them because Europe brings about a lot of positive things. And I can see it. Indonesia, for instance, it's 80% of nickel cobalt projects for batteries, 80%. 95% of these 80% are Chinese related. So Indonesia is very much aware of being dependent on China. It doesn't want to depend totally on China. So they come and they knock at our door and they say, please help us invest in our country, do things with us. And we say, okay, yeah, okay. But you have palm oil, that's not good. It's not WTO compliant, it's quite complex. Okay, we have to stop, the, we have to go beyond this. And we manage, and we need to manage to be pragmatic in our approach. And slowly, it is improving, but we need to go at a faster pace. And this is not where Europe is really excelling here, I have to say. Two points. We shouldn't get out of this saying, OK, it's, it's a lost battle. Why is it strategic? Remember what the British said for bad reasons. They said they want to get the upper hand. If they have the impression, impression when we talk about energy transition that we're losing control in Europe and in France with what is happening, the, the danger is lethal for everyone. And there are two concepts that we do not have in Europe because I listened to commissioners saying, yeah, democracy is slower. No, wrong. The US showed that in one year they've totally changed their industrial policy. And secondly, the implementation, what the young generation um, um, call it, they call it impact. When we talk about impact, it's implementing diplomacy, implementing innovations as well, because we have to target immediacy, but also think about a, um, a hidden agenda, about a, a long-term agenda, what we can generate with them, 
and that would avoid dependency uh, on our soil that we cannot solve. So impact and pace, these are two strong words. And, we, and it's not speaking against Europe when we say that, but we should have to change drastically our bureaucratic system, our red tape system, because we are, uh, we are having problems. We need to uh, target longer term. Today it's manganese and nic nickel, but maybe we'll need sulfur batteries. If we have to invest in sulfur right away, I don't know. Thank you. Just quickly, the US. It's also a big danger for industrialists. Two thirds of the 50 Jaga factories in Europe. It's a big risk because of era in the US. For 2025 dollars that you give, they give 45 dollars. And then there's also the implementation before launching an industrial project. They give you money right away in Europe. It's not the case. It's a lot of red tape assessments after one year. You're still at a standstill. So what we should do at the beginning, we have to be more responsive, more proactive. During the Rencontre Économique, at Davos, for instance, we should make into into agreements and see at which level the politicians should remain involved or no longer be involved in this industrial world, but because they just want to work hand in hand without any constraints. So we have no nickel. We have no time either. It's unfair. It may be the, the most important debate for our industrial future. And we have uh, run out of time for quite some time already. So it's a pity. But thank you for your input.